South Africans would definitely say I'm not South African. And that was my story. Mm. There was always this fear, like, oh, I'm going to be exposed. And what's going to happen when somebody finds out that I'm not South African? How are they going to treat me? And also, mm. it's parents had made a decision not to teach us Yoruba because they didn't want us to develop uh, a strong accent. Mm. And then we would be identifiable as this are Nigerians. Mm. At the time, I didn't know that that was a bit... Hello and welcome to How's Your Heart Podcast. It is Lindo for short. Thank you so much for joining me. And today we have a special guest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bit nerve-wracking, but here we go. We have a guest today. Um, her name is Grace. Oh, welcome to the podcast. I've been looking forward to have this time with you. The last time, well, the first time we met mm -hmm. was actually one of the conversations that I mentioned in my first episode um, about this lady that I met and we had a DMC <laughs> in the middle of <laughs> a networking event. Yeah. And um, that was fun. That was probably eight months ago. Yeah. 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 yeah, almost a year now, almost a year ago. a year <laughs> that is absolutely crazy. Yeah. I feel like I've known you longer, though. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's because of the book club and we've been seeing and meeting. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. We'll get to we'll get to that. Um, the book club. Um, I just remember the conversation that we had. It was um, it included God in the mist, and I was like, yeah, this is the girl. I need to. <laughs> she needs to stick around. I need to stick around her. Yeah. And since then, we've uh, we've talked about. You know, one of the yeah, one of the topics we talked about probably was dating, yes. which is something that is like, <laughs> main thing that you speak about to about two girls, yeah. and also just in general. Um, and yeah, I remember that conversation and thinking, well, um, one of the things that I wanted in London is to be surrounded by women of God, and um, you know, yeah, we've been able to do that. How how was that conversation for you and it was really really interesting so <laughs> i mean with the psyche like networking events usually it's always about where do you work um why did you move to london yeah london, what are you, are you doing now? now what are you doing now mm -hmm. I went to the next person. yeah <laughs> I used to an audit, <laughs> I used to audit. <laughs> and then they're impressed if you got out of audit yeah or, that's usually my um my selling point like oh I left audit and then now that sparks in. yeah it's like oh you made it out <laughs> no. but it's usually the same type of conversation mm. so with you it was so different because we were going so deep for us like it was some high even yeah but I mean I remember we we had so much in common in terms of um you said your dad yeah, uh, past, uh, yeah. and I was like oh those are both ski games <laughs> So yeah, that was something interesting. And then also how you were navigating mm. London as well in the struggles that you shared. Mm. I was like, oh, I can definitely relate. Yeah. It was so cool that you were vulnerable. At yeah. Such a... <laughs> yeah. I, <just> <laughs> I remember we leaving into each other and I think there, there were other people. people. <laughs> there were other people and then now they just started moving away. I was like, oh, shame. <laughs> we're just so engrossed in that yeah. conversation. Yeah. And um, it just just speaks to the move of God because you had said you had not been to Saipa events for a while as well. I don't know. I was going to the yeah, yeah. events for sure. I was going to yeah. them since I moved here um, in 2020. Well, the first one I went to was when lockdown opened. Um, so I think it was a drink. So I've been going consistently just so I could meet like South Africans. Um, so yeah, and also just <laughs> those fees. Yeah, those fees. So like at least if I can get something like drinks and nibble, then, <laughs> oh, it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and one of the other conversation that we're gonna have is talk about your journey. It making it as a CASA. Um, the cycle that we've been speaking about is the professional body for um chartered accountants in South Africa. <clears throat> But um, I guess, um, let's, start I guess let's start here. How, yeah. is, your How is your heart? What's, 
what's in your heart right now what are you trying to what are you happy about what are you finding joy in or what are you trying to figure out mm -hmm. but what's what's way weighing your heart right now i think i'm in this space where i'm trying to just not be in a rush in, mm. in terms of like life um so i'm almost 33 and this morning when i was doing my hair mm. i saw my first gray hair no and i was, and I was so sad no I was like no this is life this is life no, no. <laughs> so how are you 33 <laughs> and 32 <laughs> no, I'm a bit older to that 32 <laughs> but i am turning 33 at the end of this year so yeah, um, so I was feeling a bit anxious when I saw that um, strand of gray hair. I was like, okay, I'm really aging, whether I like it or not. Um, that's a sign. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying not to be too anxious and too, too being, I mean, too much being in a rush mm. um, in terms of goals and just trusting God that he has everything laid out for me and just, it's it's a bit of a struggle, but um, trying to trust him mm -hmm. fully, um, because as a Christian, I'm saying that um, Lord, you are an the author of my life. You have great plans for me, and yeah, to trust that you do have great plans for me. And even though um, my plans don't seem to be um, panning out the way I want, mm -hmm. um, you're still making a way. And I mean, we'll get to it later on mm -hmm. in terms of my journey here to London, journey to being a chartered accountant. That was yeah. God's plan. And not mine. Um, so just having that um, as a testimony to look back on in times like this where I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm aging, time is passing me by. You are achieving. I think I should be achieving. It's one of those things where I've been constantly being reminding myself that no god is still in charge yeah be patient mm. and have peace in knowing that he's still here with you and he has great plans for you so i think that's where my heart mm. wow i mean what what i was thinking is is this um trying to make sure that you're not in a rush yeah is that your kind of expectations that you are putting on yourself or do you feel like it's societal um, pressures as well. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's definitely both. I yeah. Mean, I'm definitely supposed to be married right now. Yeah. With my kids. Mm -hmm. um, like today is Mother's Day in South Africa. Yes. <laughs> so it's just like, ah, I'm still not a mother. <laughs> Did I not want to post a picture and be like, mother to be? <laughs> mother to be. <laughs> <You're> right? <laughs> so I'm like, ah, I'm still not a mother. And then now you have society telling you that. Uh, in two years' time, you will be uh, classified as a high-risk pregnancy, geriatric pregnancy. So it's like ugh, um, trying to not have that pressure from mm -hmm. both society and myself as well. Mm -hmm. um, to but yeah, it's well, yeah. man, uh, I can relate to that, like the, pre the pressures and um, I can just imagine what it means to get to a point where you're like, I need to stop rushing. Because yeah. I'm always on the go. <laughs> I'm always doing something. I'm always thinking something. Yeah. And I've not had that revelation of, um, you know, need to stop, need to stop rushing. Yeah. But I can just imagine what it does to your psyche as well. Mm. Because you need to be doing things. You need to be doing things. And you're like, I need to give control. Yeah. And I just and this control is never something that you had yeah. even in the beginning. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That is that is crazy. Well, thank you for sharing your heart. <laughs> um I would love to get into <laughs> deeper into that conversation. Yeah. But today we are talking about you living in, in South Africa and then the second part of the conversation is you making it as a C a C A. So yeah, your two other names, where <laughs> where is that Where's origin? That from? Okay, so that's Nigerian Yoruba. So um, both my parents are Yoruba, and I was born in Zimbabwe, and then I grew up in South Africa. Okay. <laughs> so I usually just call myself African. I'm just like, that's the easiest way to describe it, because it's like, it's hard to say pinpoint, where, yeah, pinpoint yeah. where I'm 
ex- actually from. So South Africans would definitely say I'm not South African. And that was my story growing up. I was like, okay, if I'm not South African, then w- where, like, mm, what, what am I? Yeah. yeah. Mm. And then now when I would go visit Nigeria, then Nigerians there would be like, oh, because of your accent and your mannerisms, mm. you're South African. I'm like, okay, but South Africans say I'm not South mm. African. South African and then Nigerians say I am South African. Mm. Well, where am I? Like, where do I belong? And then also some people will be like, because you were born in Zimbabwe, you're a Zimbabwean, but uh, we left when we were two. So I, I don't remember anything about Zimbabwe. So it's like hard to say I'm Zimbabwean because I was born there. So it's always just like, let's just go with African. I'm all of the above. Option, <laughs> option D. <laughs> so let's, let's go back a bit. What takes your um, parents to Zimbabwe and then yeah. to South Africa? So, I mean, if you know Nigerians, Nigerians are all of so, I mean, <laughs> they're all they all over. They move, they move, you know. So, um, my parents, or well, my dad um, used to be a missionary before he just settled into um, setting up his church. Mm-hmm. But he used to do mission work. So, when my parents got married in Nigeria, then they moved to Botswana first. Then they lived there for a couple of years. And then now they moved to Zimbabwe. Uh, when my mom gave birth to me and my twin. And then now from there, she got a job in South Africa. So then they decided let's just like stay at it because now mm-hmm. they're the proper family, three kids. So mm-hmm. they couldn't just be doing the mission work and be moving around. So that's how. Wow. Wow. And then obviously you grow up in South Africa and you mentioned that you go to Nigeria. Yep. So how how is that upbringing? Being in South Africa, when do you notice that, well, there's something different? Um, do you speak Yoruba at home or? Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another long story. Mm. So um, when my parents moved to um, South Africa, uh, they moved to Ubenda. So that's really a remote area. So my mom had gotten a job there at the hospital so we were living in like a gated hospital community in the village though and surprisingly in that um, community the gated community the the hospital area where the doctors used to stay Mm -hmm. um, there was like a diverse mix of people Mm -hmm. so we had uh, white Germans we had um, Kenyans Ugandans Zimbabweans Nigerians so it was quite a diverse um, mix of people so I grew up in that environment for about um, nine years before we moved from Benda to Louis Trifat which was the nearby town yeah. it was just about maybe 50 minutes away from Benda so um, that's where and in Louis Trifat it's, at the time it was quite a it sounds, I was about to say, like, that sounds very African. At the time, it was very African, but now things have evolved. Even the name had changed to Makado. So uh, a lot of black people mm-hmm. down, but also still a mix of African people. Um, but I also then grew up in that um, space where I was surrounded by a lot of African people. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to a worse school and a large school, both African um, schools. So... I think in terms of that background, I always just had a mix of of different mm. differences, like diverse people around me. So, and then also, my parents had made a decision not to teach us Yoruba because they didn't want us to develop uh, a strong accent, mm. and then we would be identifiable as this Nigerian. Mm. At the time, I didn't know that that was a bit of a fear for mm. them. But uh, obviously, when xenophobia started becoming a big thing, mm. then now it was like, okay, maybe they did make a wise decision. Mm. Although, like me and my sister kind of resented my parents a bit for not teaching us Europa. So we've been trying to learn like through a lot of, you know, Afrobeats music and movies as well, mm. but it's still not so fluent. So they they did sometimes speak to us in Europa, but it was just really the base. Mm-hmm. So my Yoruba is not that good. Um, 
like my Venda is way better. My Africans is way better than my Yoruba. But it's always been like a strong desire of mine to be able to speak um, Yoruba. But yeah. A story. <laughs> that is a story. I'm just thinking like about your parents making that decision, right? And just there must have been something that was happening at the time um, in order for them to kind of prepare you guys for something like the 2008 xenophobia attacks. Yeah. And I'm just thinking when when I moved to London, mm-hmm. I was like definitely teaching my kids Kosa. Yeah. Like they definitely... Even if you're in London, you definitely have to know. And now thinking, well, the reason why people don't teach their kids, their mother tongue, is not only because they're not proud of their culture. Yeah. There could be so many reasons. Yeah. And hearing that, I've, I've never heard that. Yeah. Like, I've never had that reference. And now, like, being also surrounded by these different cultures and finding yourself in the mix as well. Yeah. Um, so in, in primary high school, are you, are people ask you, oh, well, you don't have an accent, so yeah. you probably just treat it as any other black, black person. Uh, no. So no. My, my last name was always a dead giveaway that we're not from there because mm. it's an O and you know the O's are from West Africa. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, the last name, my surname would always be a giveaway that um, we're not from there. And I guess uh, because we would always be speaking English, uh, people would then ask, like, I, mm. why are you speaking English? Uh, mm. Where are you from? I'm like, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> There's Exposed. that question. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, um, that, that's what it was. Mm. Yeah. That must have been difficult, though. Definitely. So there was always this, yeah, uh, I, I think later, towards later on, mm. when xenophobia started, becoming a thing Mm -hmm. there was always this fear like oh i'm gonna be exposed and what's going to happen when somebody finds out that i'm not how are they going to treat me also it's life-threatening because xenophobia in south africa is pretty much a it's a big thing Mm -hmm. it's a huge hate crime and it's like i always say it's like the spirit of hate Mm -hmm. um it's a dark spirit but the the way they go about it is attacking only African foreigners mm. in, in South Africa and not all foreigners. Mm. For example, like the people that are stealing the world mm. in, in South Africa and that's like the fundamental uh, or the premise of the xenophobia is that um, there's foreign people taking their jobs and taking the wealth mm. in, in the country. But then now the foreign people are actually not really mm. your Africans. It is your white mm. But um I think it's an easier battle to just fight the your fellow Africans. Mm. And that's what it was. Um, tackling the Africans. So it's, I think it was even rebranded or renamed to Afrophobia mm. as opposed to xenophobia because it didn't meet that definition. Mm. Xenophobia Afrophobia hate towards our fellow Africans mm. and um, the burning of people, the the boycotting as well. So like even with my dad's church, like a lot of people like left the church, especially mm. after 2008. Um, there was even a robbery at the, the church. So they stole like the equipment, the music, the mm. speakers. Um, and also with my mom. So she has the medical, a, a dental practice. So she's a dentist. So before 2008, like the practice was thriving. Mm. And then after the big xenophobia, mm. then a lot of patients decided, no, we're not going to go to a Nigerian dentist. Um, um, and it's funny because there weren't a lot of dentists. Uh, even here in London, there's mm. not a lot of dentists. Like, yeah, not a lot of... Especially black. Yeah, black mm. as well. So um, I don't know what people were doing with it. Yeah. But they decided... <laughs> They're not going to go to a Nigerian um, dentist practice, rather uh, boycott, make sure that they leave. So that was the experience. So um, it was pretty hectic. Mm. Yeah. I guess it's like, um, I think one of the definitions of xen- xenophobia is the fear of. Yeah. Like people just fearing of the unknown. Yeah. 
of how they could be impacted. And sometimes it's just criminals, honestly, um, that take opportunity of whatever whatever is happening at the time. Um, I mean, you've mentioned the the impact on your family yeah. as well, which is something like it's unimaginable mm. like, that you know someone goes through that for just because of who they are. Yeah. And um, I was just thinking of people that tell stories about you know racism in schools, yeah. being in the Afrikaans school as well. Um, I mean. How, how did that um, impact your upbringing as well? Or your understanding of the world? Um, because not only are you black, yeah. but also now adding adding on that being a Nigerian. Yeah, and there is a, there is a a negative perception, generally negative perception of Nigerians. Um, I remember when I when I came this side that that's when I was like, oh. Nigerians are not like I had a different perception yeah. because of um we told that Nigerians are scammers, Nigerians are, you know, they they drug dealers and, and all of that. And then coming here and I've never been exposed to like other African people. Yeah. Having stayed in Cape Town. I think maybe people in Joburg would be exposed to yeah. different different um different people from other countries. Yeah. So for me, it was like completely different. I've known Afrikaans or Kosa people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very different. So I, I, I think moving to London has kind of exposed me in that way. And I imagine people back home, most, maybe 90% of people have the experience that I have yeah. that only when you go out and now you become a foreigner. Mm-hmm. Then you understand, oh. <laughs> and it's unfortunate yeah. that that that's the way it is. But I don't think as people, um, we understand what it means to just go to a different country. It's not because, well, I am, you know, like you don't love your country. Yeah. And now I'm, uh, it's not because I don't love South Africa. The reason why I'm here, I'm like, if you tell me to go home, I'll go home. I'll pack my bed. For the right opportunity. <laughs> Not a comparable salary. No, I, think, <laughs> I, I feel like in this, in the sense that if, you know, there would be attacks on like foreigners, yeah. I'll be like, you know what? Fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll mm-hmm. go home. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the perception of people, even here, is is that privilege and that that positionality of not understanding why other people have moved from from their home countries yeah. and kind of have a misconception of this is the reason why they have moved. Yeah. So yeah, like how how did that then shape, um, especially being from an African school, if yeah. that had any impact? Yes, definitely. So I think with racism, that one was different because at least all black were the target group. So yeah. it, I had the comfort in numbers. So if there was an Afrikaans person that was racist towards me or racist towards a sibling or a classmate, a black classmate, mm. um, it was an attack on all assets, black people. Mm. That's South African. So that one was, um, it was definitely different. In in terms of being Nigerian, so we, me and my sister were the only Nigerians in the school at the time. Um, I think there was one other person from Zimbabwe, I think. Mm. But um, in terms of Nigerians, like we were the only ones at the time um, in the whole school. So, but also in Limpopo, xenophobia yeah. wasn't so big until 2008 or until um, it became this huge mm. national. But before, like Venda people loved and I always say, like, it's always this two extremes. Like, with South Africans, they either really love mm-hmm. Nigerians or they really hate them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, initially, our experience growing up was that the Venda people really loved Nigerians. They loved my dad. They always, like, called him Bafunzi, 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 Pastor, mm-hmm. and Pastor. Um, so, they really loved him. They respected Nigerians as well when it comes to like, spirituality mm-hmm. and stuff. So um, I 
my first initial years of upbringing, that was me seeing that, okay, amongst uh, black people, we're safe. They, they are accommodating to us. So it's fine. And also, um, I think in 1994, there was, I don't know if it was like um, a scheme in exchange, but there was a mass inflow of like professionals from Nigeria because um, I think uh, Britain left Nigeria around that time. I'm not sure about the exact date. So they, Nigeria got that independence around that time. So in terms of schooling, um, a lot of people had the opportunity to study very early. So you, you had your medical doctors, you had your professors as well. So those were the key skills that were being uh, invited into South Africa mm-hmm. at that time, around 1994. And that was why my mom was so got the opportunity to come to South Africa because they were asking, they were looking for a lot of African professionals mm-hmm. um, to come and work in South Africa. So that was, initially it sounded like foreigners are welcome. Mm-hmm. And that's how a lot of them got into the country. Yes, the, it's unfortunate that there were also other opportunists or criminals like mm-hmm. uh, drug dealers that came um, with the pack. But mm-hmm. they were also really a minority um, the drug dealers, but they, they are the ones who just created this negative um, brand oh. for Nigerians, uh, which was really unfortunate. But um, for the most part, like a lot of the people, the Nigerians I knew, they all had good jobs. Though. Mm-hmm. None of them were scammers. So that stereotype of scammers, you know, it was mostly the professional. And um, in Nigeria, like we have this um, pride thing called like, Niger not they carry last. <laughs> so it's like this thing. Who told me that? Who told me that? Was it you? <laughs> <laughs> we know they carry last. <laughs> so that's like this thing. Like we have to excel in everything that we do. Yeah. And even in our upbringing, like we were told you can't fail in another yeah. country. Mm. And you must always like strive for the top. We can't be last. So even in school, like we had to be on top. It was just a given. Like couldn't be getting and the average sixties. That's so average. So mm-hmm. we always had to be like top top three. That would make your parents proud, and it would make you feel like I'm still carrying that Nigerian flag in another person's another man's country. Mm-hmm. So um, because of that motto, that was like a drive, and that's why you see a lot of like Nigerians excelling. Um, because of that upbringing and that um, root, mm-hmm. you no, know, we can't carry that. Um, <laughs> that I love very, that. That was very English of me to carry that. <laughs> yeah. You know, they carry last. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, to answer the question, like, with racism, it wasn't as mm-hmm. big an issue because there was safety in numbers. Mm-hmm. But with xenophobia, it was all, oh, attention is on. Mm-hmm. You, you. So, yeah, it was very isolated and more scary in that sense. Just thinking now um, about the experience now of trying to, you know, go back to those roots yeah. and trying to, um, you know, find a home, mm-hmm. um, a place called home. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, mentioned different, mentioning Nigeria, South Africa, Zimbabwe. Yeah. And you said, like, home is now Africa as yeah. a whole. Um, but I imagine what that does to you because I moved around a lot. Um, I went to six different schools altogether. And I, I imagine the reason why we're able maybe to um, adapt to so much change, mm-hmm. like being in London, is probably because of those experiences. Yeah. And in as much as yeah, <laughs> people could... I use this, this, this fact as my... You know those games where you use... Two truths and one, one lie. Yeah. I always use that. Yeah. <laughs> I went to six different schools and people are like, no, that's, no, a, that's lie. a lie. <laughs> um, I guess now, like, coming coming to yourself mm-hmm. and coming to that identity in that part of you yeah. and, you know, learning Yoruba as well. Mm-hmm. And now you're learning all of this, but you still call South Africa home. Yeah. How How's that... <laughs> <laughs> complicated yeah but the funny thing is 
from a very young age, I always knew that like my struggle or something that I would be wrestling with like for the rest of my life is identity and mm. where I fit in. So also because I'm a twin and I have an identical mm. twin sister, I always knew that I would always have to somehow fight my way into identifying myself mm. differently um, and not being boxed or grouped into this one identity as, yeah. a, as a twin, as a Nigerian, as a Zimbabwean, mm. as a South African. So I've always been, it's definitely affected like uh, my identity, but then now I've also made sure consciously to not let it affect my identity and just understand what my truth is. Mm. I'm just all encompassing um, in the sense that yes, my, my heritage, my background is quite, is not your conventional, straightforward, mm. I was born in this place and I grew up mm. and my ancestors are from this place. Um, it's more complex than that and it's okay. That's just where, yeah. and it's also not unusual because also moving here to London, that's like the story of a lot of black people here. Mm. They're not from here. Um, some of them were not even born here, but they mm. grew up here. So it's it's not an unusual thing and mm. it doesn't have to be this thing that makes you feel like I don't know who I am. Mm. You know? mm. I need to find myself. Yeah. I guess it's just that thing of you don't know any other life. Yeah. That's the life you if you had if you were able to live a different life, then yeah. you'd say, Oh, compare you compare yeah. but then there's nothing else to compare. That's yeah. just been your life. It has been. <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what has been some of the positive things? Because I think there's so much in this conversation that yeah. maybe we're just, you know, scratching <laughs> the surface with yeah. it. Because um, I think, the, as I said, there's so much that we need to understand as mm. South Africans um, in terms of relating with other African people, especially other African people, because yeah. it, it, it's much easier to deal with uh, a tourist, a white, um, you know, or a white tourist or a white foreigner, yeah. but uh, we still can't grapple with, um, you know, other black people. Yeah. And and I, I guess it's just also reflecting on, on me, as I said, reflecting on my experiences moving here and mm -hmm. ex looking at, you know, Africa Unite and just trying to understand other people better yeah. because that's not something that I've had opportunity to to have before. Mm -hmm. That's not something that I even thought about. Mm -hmm. But I now understand the privileged place that I was in. And um, and now looking back, I'm like, well, I, <laughs> I don't think there's anything different I could have done because mm -hmm. I wasn't in spaces where I could could have made someone else feel, you know, um, uncomfortable, or maybe I would think, oh, maybe I could have said something different, yeah. or made someone feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess what 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 do you think is the positive uh, aspects of South Africa and having been a foreigner in South Africa mm -hmm. um, that you've experienced? Yeah, I think. One positive thing that um, South Africa um, brings, or uh, growing up in South Africa, we learned about like Ubuntu and just like mm. oneness, like I am because you are. So growing up in that kind of environment, um, it's different to Nigerians because like Nigerians, that they can be very tribalistic. So. Mm. It's the Yorubas versus the Igbos. But I know South Africa also has the mm -hmm. Kosas versus the Zulus. But <laughs> yeah, but it's not really that rife. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that different in yeah. that sense. But like, it's one of the things I really appreciated growing up in um, South Africa is getting to see that and mm. how kind people are to each other in terms of um, it's. It was, it's tra not tradition, but like when you are walking like in the office, you greet the next mm. person, you know. Yeah. It's, it's rude if you don't, you know. Mm. It's just a norm to do things like that. Like you acknowledge the next person mm. and not just ignore them. So that's another thing that I really appreciated growing up in South Africa. Mm. Then there was the music. Like I know like I'm a piano is this big thing. Yeah. Now. 
And I honestly get bored of Salatiana <laughs> because there's like so much so nice much, uh, yeah. South African music out there. Mm. Um, but yeah, in terms of the music scene, like South African music, Kwaito, House, those mm. were really nice. Like growing up in those, uh, with those music, um, that was really nice. And the dancing as well. South African dancers are really dope. <laughs> Outside yeah. of Abba Piano, <laughs> there's proper, proper South African dancers. So, um, and um, I like to dance. So, mm. um, doing South African, or being around South African, um, mm. South Africans would love to dance and learning their, their style of dance was one of the positives. And then the food as well. Um, seven colors. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, which food? <laughs> yeah, seven colors. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and it's funny because, like, uh, Nigerians, they have this, like, battle or competition with Ghanaians in and terms jollof. of jollof I'm just like guys there's more out there <laughs> than jollof there's, there's seven, seven, there's seven right? colors there's seven colors there's braai meat um, and also like there's maguinya versus mm. puff puff I want to see that battle of mm. maguinya versus puff puff like it's there's a really a lot of nice yeah. food out there so and I think because I'm from all these backgrounds I can say okay guys there's more Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about puff puff and Maguinia, have you seen please. this? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk about Shaki and uh, tribe. What's tribe? Um, what's the local name for tribe? Yeah, uh, we call it Lusu. Um, oh, okay, no. In Kosa, <laughs> wow. <laughs> in Venda, it was something different. The name has escaped. I think it's it's different. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. different. But in terms of food, definitely there's like. Uh, a conversation that needs to be had um, mm. around food but like I, I'm so grateful that I was exposed to both yeah and um, yeah this is definitely something I appreciate about like South Africa the, the food scenery it's mm. really good. I don't miss the food you don't miss the food <laughs> <laughs> why <laughs> it's just one of those things I'm yeah. just like oh well <laughs> can I'll do have it out. yeah I can, can, I do, can it do it out because yeah. I know a lot of people are like um <laughs> Some people judge me because mm-hmm. of the spices that I use. Yeah. I'm like, I can't be carrying spices from South, South Africa. Africa all the way. Like, all the way. <laughs> Guys, there's spices here. <laughs> there's aromats. You can find aromats. But people think like it's different. Yeah. People say it's different and I'm like, well. <laughs> Some of it is <laughs> like raja, certified raja curry here. Yeah. <laughs> Because I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. Well, um, I guess um, the reason why I felt like this this conversation was uh, much needed is because I, I just want to, I'm trying to understand more. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, um, a lot of South Africans definitely need to have this conversation, need to think about this. And I'm so grateful that you were willing to have this conversation. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you on the next one.